Thanks very much. Um, uh, I'm Ed from Equinix. Um, a little tiny bit about me. Um, I run the open source partner program at Equinix. If you were at the last talk, this, some bits of this might be familiar in structure and style, but we do things a little bit differently. Um, uh, on social networks, I'm a W8EMV, which happens to be my ham radio call sign. And if you're interested, I'm doing, hosting a boff on open source and ham radio um, over the course of the time here. So some of these slides are going to be blindingly obvious for people who are at this event. Um, and you, what you have to think in your mind is um, think like an enterprise sometimes. And I know that's foreign to some people, so I'm going to try to guide you through some of the decision making that large companies deal with when they're dealing with open source um, and how uh, different that is from the individual point of view and then how that turned into the work that we did uh, getting uh, hardware for uh, porting software to ARM. So um, open source is important. We know that because we're here. Uh, it's ubiquitous. It's foundational. Um, you can tell people that it's influential for IT leaders. Um, uh, if you're Red Hat, you can do a survey of your customers and get a very high percentage point of people saying that it's important. I don't want to belabor that point here other than it's totally not biased. Um, it's completely, uh, uh, completely on the level. Um, but you know, people agree that uh, open enter that enterprise systems uh, have benefits uh, for for open source infrastructure. Um, it's faster to market. Uh, it, it lets people be faster to market because they don't have to negotiate complex deals. Um, it helps in human resources and hiring because it's can be very easy to identify talent if you're doing an open source project and someone has demonstrated confidence in that project, the risks that you have of making a bad hire goes way down. Um, and just generally, it uh, provides uh, a, 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 a uplifting of the quality of software that gets produced within an enterprise. And enterprises are known for uh, enterprise quality systems, which is to say good enough to collect money, maybe not the best system in the world, but good enough to collect money. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of good reasons for that. But sometimes enterprises have a really hard time contributing to the open source projects that they depend on. Uh, they might not have an open source program office, so there may be no central element for things there. Uh, there might be not very much time for them to uh, throw at this separate from their product efforts. Um, it can be very hard to donate cash to something because you're inside a business and businesses generally don't donate cash without some strings attached. So um, you occasionally get this. I hope that everyone in the open source world has a poster of this on their wall in their den uh, because it gets used in every single presentation. Um, this was specifically for the uh, uh, presentation that I did uh, to folks uh, right before KubeCon when uh, etcd was having some uh, organizational problems and suddenly everyone realized that every kubernetes cluster depended on this component even though no one had heard of it and so much open source software goes under maintained even though we're all using it um and I'll, i think i can explain a little bit of why of why that happens so um how do you contribute again as a as a big organization without necessarily writing any code, okay? So I am capable of writing code. You do not want to run the code that I'm capable of writing. I'm, I'm just gonna be upfront with you there. I can read code pretty well. I can open issues. I'm unlikely to close the issue that I open. So you can certainly help with documentation, um, uh, proofreading, tutorials, uh, comments on existing documentation, all that stuff. Um, if you're in a world where multiple languages are important to you and your organization, you can contribute to the translation problem. Uh, community is a big piece of this, and I'll talk more about that in, in a moment. And the, the, the biggest part of what we do at Equinix, which again is not a software company, it's not even really a hardware company like I promised. It's a real estate investment trust, uh, which makes it a very weird beast 
to be in the open source world at all, we can contribute with infrastructure because we've got real estate, okay? So community, um, uh, my, my personal experience with community in the ARM system, um, we uh, has been uh, doing things like, and this was early in the process of, of, of the bring up process, things like watching, watching social media for keywords. Um, imagine searching GitHub for every mention of the string ARM64. Um, you couldn't do that now, you'd be overwhelmed because there's so much work. But seven years ago, that was a rare thing. And so you would use that process to collect people who cared. That, that worked out pretty well. Um, whenever you're entering a new community for any kind of new open source software, uh, you can uh, do the multiple step process of identifying the events that are relevant because you may not know anything about which events are going to be to matter. Then once you've found them, figuring out how to attend those events and then presenting at those events. So I had the good fortune of uh, finding the Lenaro community, which does a lot of work in the ARM64 world, and uh, going to one of their conferences. It was the weirdest conference to go to as a new person to that ecosystem because like everyone was talking about everything except the stuff in computing that I was used to. And so it was just a, you know, they're talking about bootloaders. It's like, I guess you have to worry about that. Uh, uh, no one had... Like, like there was a world of little teeny server, little teeny machines around, um, the most of which I'd never seen before. So it was just a really interesting world. Making your way into a new community is a lot, is a lot like that. Um, most parts of a functioning community have a low noise, uh, contributors only uh, platform that's not terribly popular channel for the people who are really the core contributors to communicate with each other. So that means if you're used to Twitter, you're gonna to have to go to the Wayback Machine and find an IRC channel because that's where the people actually hang out or some other thing that's not mainstream. Um, and then once you get start to get into the community efforts of things, things like sponsoring and funding community events, um, finding corporate money and marketing, which there sometimes is, to sponsor conferences, and just learning and knowing the people who are doing things and meeting them for the first time, sometimes after years of, of working with them online. So the case study here is uh, a project we did called Works on ARM. This was at a, a, a predecessor to, so tiny bit of corporate history. I used to work for Packet, which was a startup. Packet got acquired by Equinix. My job has changed, but it hasn't changed. And some of the stories I'll tell are, are like, how does a tiny underfunded startup company do this? And we created a project called Works on ARM with support uh, from ARM at Packet uh, before the acquisition. Um, part of it was, what do you do with hardware that's interesting but hard to sell? Um, so we had a bunch of uh, Cavium Thunder X uh, equipment that was purchased to be a uh, server offering and uh, frankly it wasn't selling very well um, so we had we had some surplus um, and we had some people who were interested in taking these machines that were like technically very interesting but economically kind of difficult and making the business case for keeping them keeping them um, so with works on arm at packet um, the the interface to asking for resources and you can't see that from here but it dates back to like 2017 or so. So seven years ago, very early on in the, very early on in the uh, ARM ecosystem from the perspective of cloud native work, like containers were a new thing back then and multi-architecture containers were a new thing back then. Uh, Phil Estes is uh, gonna be doing a talk after mine about that whole multi-architecture container thing, but that very much brought a community together. Um, and, uh, you know, just giving people access to hardware and having them, having them work with it, made it, big, made it has made a big difference. One of the things I learned um, was that uh, you can start small, but it, if you have a little bit of leverage, you can make a, a good effort at it. 
Um, the unique uh, leverage that we had there was a company called SoftBank, which is a big investment company that had invested in ARM and also had invested in Packet. So making connections was very easy, and I just happened to wander into that world. That was very lucky. Um, some dependencies also, we found that um, I, I've had to have this conversation multiple times. You're working on something, management comes along, they say, what the hell is this? I've never heard of it before. None of our customers have ever asked for this. None of the, none of the things that you're doing or anything, I, like, why are you doing this? And I, I tell the story of uh, Basil, which is a build system, which is notoriously hard to build the build system, but some things that people actually care about, like TensorFlow at the time, depended on Basil to be built. So the conversation was, well, you said you wanted AI. To get AI, you, you probably can acknowledge that TensorFlow is relevant. And TensorFlow depends on, I just name dropped you, so. <laughs> um, TensorFlow depends on Basil to build, so you're gonna keep this on your radar and, and work with this. And you, know, you have to go down the rabbit holes a couple times and you say, bring carrots, because you'll need them, because you're going down the rabbit hole. Um, the other thing that was really interesting about the ARM ecosystem at that time was there weren't very many people with servers around. They were just like, they didn't exist. Uh, but there was a huge number of people who had Raspberry Pis at home. Um, and by the Pi 3, you could build a system, build all your binaries for distributions and run them on the Pi and have a very outsized audience for the work that you were doing, even though you didn't have an audience directly for the server systems that you had because they didn't exist yet. But there was a big uh, consumer audience for that. So that helped a lot. Um, uh, from a supply chain point of view, um, one of the things about uh, uh, projects is that you're very much looking for uh, overlapping interests and people in the world who are doing things that depend on you, that you depend on but that are, that are not uh, uh, directly uh, connected to you. So um, when I found that other people cared about running containers for multiple ar ar operating systems at the same time, that was an obvious, like, well, if they've gone there already, I'm going to go there right behind them. So that, that worked out really well. And if you have an open source program office, I'll work with them. And if you don't, figure out why that you don't have one. Um, there is no OSPO at Equinix. I guess there is an open source partner program, which, which fits that role. And, and that works out pretty well. And I'm going to skip mostly over this, but because uh, I've covered a lot of it. Um, the, the, uh, the, the hardest part about the ARM journey that I've had so far has been um, trying to um, get familiarity with people working with systems that have lots of cores. Um, the usual developer's mindset about what a computer looks like is a four core or maybe an eight core machine. And if you suddenly give them an 80-core machine, um, they're not really used to that thought. And the uh, Equinix Metal Service is a bare metal service. Um, so just getting familiarity with the infrastructure is like, oh, you can throw lots of cores at this problem. You don't have to worry about time sharing a single core to do multiple tasks. You can go, go laterally on that. Um, just getting developer familiarity with that uh, is a big deal. And you know, even benchmarking systems where they say, well, if we get linear performance up to this point, and I'll tell them, well, you've just only started. You do that 10 more times and tell me where the curve fails off. Um, and then the, the other thing about uh, dependency, the other thing about like rabbit holes that you can go down is just understanding when you have to be impatient about stuff and when, can, when, you, when can you be patient. Um, a lot of projects' lifespans are measured in years, if you're lucky. And many of the good ones have been around for decades. So even if it's really important to everyone, um, the message might, you know, so some people are going to move on if some tiny thing breaks. They're going to say, ah, broken. I'll go back to what I'm used to. And you want to really hunt down the people who say, oh, broken. I like that. I can work on that.
So that's, some people have a low tolerance or broken, others not so much. So, so uh, how do we contribute? We contribute with infrastructure. Um, Equinix has uh, 260 data centers around the world. Um, 30 plus of those have uh, Equinix metal systems that are available on demand uh, to boot and, and run yours. Uh, we can put pretty much uh, anything you want in any of these data centers as co-location, but we can also manage the infrastructure, manage the hardware on these in these 30 sites. So that's a that's a advantage, right? So we have a lot of things out there that we can throw at the project. And so the uh, following works on ARM, I started working on our open source partner program, which is a combination of ARM server stuff, x86 from a couple vendors, and uh, listening for what people want next. And it's all bare metal servers. It's not virtualized. So it lets people do things like uh, do um, uh, do uh, work on virtual virtualization environments directly, which has been really helpful. Um, over the years, we started with a few core things and then have expanded over time. And this is the obligatory, I, I think it would, this was described to me as the placemat slide with lots of logos on it. Um, uh, we, we help a lot of folks uh, with a lot of things. Um, and uh, there's a, on the order of about 100 projects, all told, uh, that get some level of support. Um, one of the ones I'm particularly proud of is NTP pool. Uh, we provide infrastructure that makes your clock give the right time. And that's kind of neat. Um, we've got, I got a couple of case of sort of like case studies, but generally the, the workloads that we'll see um, will be similar if you were at the previous talk, but a little bit different. So the testing sort of work for CICD and benchmarking, uh, hosting for uh, uh, software that you're gonna distribute to the world. We do have a global network so we can distribute things globally, which helps folks. And then short-term needs for projects, um, labs, workshops, proof of concept efforts. Um, one success story is Alpine Linux. Um, Alpine's important to us because every server, every bare metal server, as it boots up, goes through a process where at, at some point in time it's running, Al it's running Alpine. So we very much depend on that Linux as a distributed system uh, for, for keeping track of stuff. Um, the Alpine folks, uh, some of them, some of the folks who have been on the Alpine project are here. Uh, we really like what they do. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a good collaboration. Um, we support the Linux kernel, uh, both as uh, with free infrastructure and also paid infrastructure, because they uh, have some co-location space with us. Um, uh, my favorite uh, quote ever, Equinix is indispensable. Without it, half the internet breaks. And you say, well, I, I hope we're supporting the good half, right? Um, and then uh, we also work with Flat Car Linux, which uh, originally was a Kinfolk project and now is part of Microsoft. Um, and uh, Tilo, uh, who's, who I will probably see next at um, Rejects, which is the conference for people who couldn't get into KubeCon, um, but who will have a good paper and want to present it anyway, uh, says the metal allows us to test not, our, not just our bare metal releases, but also multiple virtualization vendors. So it's a little bit specialized in the sense that you probably, like our infrastructure is kind of bad if you just need two cores, but if you need bare metal access, it's a, it's a big deal, so. Uh, the impact, um, I'm in a marketing department, which I guess explains why I don't write very much code, um, uh, but the impact is uh, working things into uh, product strategy, Sometimes you'll see customer success stories as part of our marketing efforts. We very much value the collaboration we get with experts and the work that we do with various foundations that are doing uh, software, um, supporting software efforts on a big scale. So um, if you are in an organization that wants to do something like I'm doing, which I, I think is a reasonable thing, uh, prepare for it to take a long time. Um, I've been 
I got started eight years ago, plus or minus. Um, I started doing the work a little bit before I got paid to do the work, which is always a little bit of an awkward situation. But with startups, that sometimes happens. You know, you become an early customer of someone who's doing something good, and finally, a few months later, they find some money to pay you, and then finally, a few months later, they, you convince them to hire you, and then there you go. Um, it's always useful to identify parts of the critical path of your system, the dependencies that you're working on, to make sure that you're not stuck uh, with something breaking that uh, really needs to work. Um, it's been super helpful that in my world to find parts of the organization that I work in that, are, that have some kind of surplus, right, that are doing something where they haven't used their whole budget or they have things that aren't really budget-based that they can do more of. That might be meeting space for events. That might be equipment that's um, billed at some internal rate that's different from the external rate. There's all sorts of opportunities, you know, like last year's run of hardware that you can't sell, like whatever it is. That there's almost always in organizations big enough some kind of internally underused resource that's on the critical path of somewhere else that you can leverage to solve a problem. Um, and again, if you don't have an OSPO, find one or be one. But if you do have an OSPO, talk to those folks and figure out uh, what, we're, what, what, gives them, uh, what gives them trouble. So open source makes good business sense. Again, I, I don't feel like I have to tell this crowd that, right? I think everyone has bought into some piece of that. But really, very much, it needs more than just code. Um, it needs the sort of organizational support beyond people making commits because from an infrastructure perspective those commits really can't be tested until some number of machine hours of compute get used and machine hours of compute are not free and we've worked with some open source projects who are constrained not by their ability to think or their ability to write code but by their ability to marshal the sort of resources that they need to test and uh, deliver that to the world. Um, all right, thank you very much. Um, uh, please uh, raise awareness. Please, if you have the means, sponsor projects. Um, again, WADMV is my call sign. If you search for that diligently enough, you'll find my home, home address and you can send me a postcard or something. But. Uh, uh, <laughs> because that's how it works. But I, th I really believe that every organization can find some sort of unique way to contribute um, beyond writing code. And a lot of the success that we've had in the ARM world um, has been not about, not about how many lines of code we've contributed to projects, but by how many projects we've enabled to do the work that they've done. So and with that, thank you very much. And I'll take any questions, either ringers from the audience that have been planted or, or, uh, or others. And I've, I do have more stories about um, various things that we've found along the way as we get people onto high core count systems. Um, I think there are common issues in, in all parallelism, but if you don't know Amdahl's law, you should study it. Sure. Um, about uh, client selection, client is the wrong word. Um, how do you, you're offering uh, hosting and compute to various open source projects. Right. Um, just anyone who comes asking, or is there a selection process? Or yeah, so that's the question that I asked last time. Um, and I think it's a great question because I've struggled with this over, over time. Um, the, for the first couple of years, especially for the ARM stuff, it was just like, bring it on. Like, I don't know what to expect. If your project looks like it's being run by two or more people and that it has some number of users and you can make a case for it, it was pretty easy. Um, as time went on, the criteria got a little bit more stringent just because it was very clear that I could only cope with 
talking to so many projects. And I wanted to be selective about the ones. It was not a machine resources problem. It was a human problem. Um, and the human problem was, are you doing something? And this is sort of how it is now. Are you doing something so that if an executive VP asks me, why are you supporting this project? I can tell the story and be totally confident that you will say, that's great. I'd never heard of that, but that's, that's important right now. And so um, the, it's going to be sort of graduated based on spend, like how much people are using. If it's a small project underneath some threshold, like I care, because it's one more person I need to talk to, but no one in management is going to care. And every time you go up an order of magnitude of cost, you probably get one more level of oversight for things. Um, and if the n number is at the highest, it's like, well, what are we getting out of this relationship, right? It's, are we, are we learning something? Is it key to our product? Can it, does it contribute to our marketing efforts? Does it, um, are we getting like special treatment at the conference that the organization reports? So there's, there's a whole bunch of, of like tit for tat. What, what are we getting out of it stuff? So I'd say at the smallest level, there's, I have a lot of discretion, like how does this fit in the whole picture? And then as the ask goes up and up, there's more and more potential for not just me to make a decision about it, but a couple of layers of management with whatever their priorities are for the year. Does that, I mean, does that kind of answer it? I mean, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to okay. Do. Yeah, I mean, if someone came with an AI, if it, with a big AI project right now, it's like, well, like, who do I need to talk to? And are they going to say yes or no? Right. How do you handle what's the from the project? Um, so support requests, the, the, the projects are set up as, as regular customers, just customers that happen to get a either very large or a complete discount on their bill. But we have a 24-7 operations that goes on. And so if someone has a routine question, like I can't reach my server, you know, I have a question about how the system works, I'm backstopped by a global organization, which is great, right? I, I, I don't have to be up late at night debugging why a particular circuit is not, is dropping packets or whatever. Um, the, uh, the general support process is very much front-loaded. Like the first couple months of someone being online takes most of the time because you're bringing them up on system features and explaining things to them and telling them about things that they should know but they don't know, you know, stuff like that. But it's very much like I can go on vacation and say, you're a customer, talk to support. Just open up a ticket, like they'll deal with it. <laughs> um, in general, no, because people get vetted pretty well. Um, the There is an interesting class of, I wouldn't call it abuse, but misbehavior, where someone's automation system perfects the ability to create new machines and doesn't perfect the ability to destroy them when they're done. So you get people in these loops where they'll spin up four machines and they'll think that they've gotten torn down, but they didn't get torn down. And then they'll spin up four more machines and that iterates. And so we have to do a fair amount of work just keeping track of inventory levels and project usage levels and keep on top of usage. And then if something goes wrong, it usually only goes wrong once, but you have to teach people, like, all right, you're doing a CI system. You're spinning up bare metal when you're done. We've got some backstops to tear things down automatically if we need to. We can set a timer on a machine that says, you know, after three days, delete this system, destroy this system, even though it's, you know, no matter whether it's in use or not, just get rid of it. Um, in terms of malicious use, um, 
I would, I guess I would characterize it as um, all projects with collective leadership sometimes have part of their leadership do things that are unexpected. I don't, I, that's like a super diplomatic way of saying, yeah, things have gone wrong every once in a while. They don't tend to go wrong for very long, but part of the process of bringing people on board also includes taking them offline when they're done or when we're done with them. And that can either be like, we just don't have the resources to continue or uh, your project has stopped or there's, uh, hard to get a commitment from management to keep doing things, or in the case for me this year, like uh, uh, very much uh, like uh, we want you to spend less last year than you did this year, so like look at every project carefully. But usually it's not abuse. Usually it's like mismanagement rather than abuse. And you had a question in the back as well. One, two million, yeah. When we started with the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which was what those numbers came from, um, the 25,000 number was at Packet, which is a much smaller organization. And it also was a, um, a commitment that the CNCF didn't think that they ever were going to, ever were going to use all of. Uh, they didn't understand the demand for bare metal services. They um, were were hopeful that it would work out, but didn't didn't make any promises. And I worked pretty thoroughly to find all the projects that I could find and make sure that they knew about this and and did stuff. Um, the The second round of growth was at acquisition time, so we went we were at a point where we wanted to make some marketing noise, not only about the work that we were doing, but also about the change of management. And so that was a good time to pin a number on the board and say, look how much more we're doing, and it, it's a marketing story. Um, year on year, like I said, I'm, I've been encouraged to um, shrink things over this calendar year. I'm very hopeful that that's shrinking in advance of growing again, but maybe it's going to be steady state. I don't really know. Uh, a lot of it is based on my ability to collect projects that have senior vice presidents or executive vice presidents that are happy, um, to be honest. Um, and sometimes that's a hard sell for infrastructure stuff, and sometimes it's an easy sell. So. Thanks. Um, yeah. It's the value of the compute time. So discounted accordingly into real dollars, right? It's real, it's real value, but it's not, it's not a stack of cash, right? Um, and yeah, and, and the, the fun part was that prior to Packet being acquired by Equinix, um, the accounting systems really weren't as refined as they are, as you might expect in a big company, right? If the, if the co-founder says, give these people some hardware, then you give them the hardware, right? Whereas now I've got multiple levels of management above me who are all looking at spreadsheets. Um, some of them are looking at spreadsheets. Spreadsheets are fun, right? Just lovely, just wonderful. Yeah, so the systems that we have, so we, the, the work that I did started out on uh, Cavium Thunder X, um, and it moved from that to uh, a uh, unreleased Qualcomm product that we provided people infrastructure to, and uh, a unsellable uh, Huawei product that got uh, made unsellable by uh, trade restrictions. Um, and then those two systems disappeared and we went to Ampere EMAG. And then when the newer systems came out, we have Ampere 
Mount Snow in production and Mount Jade in the Works on Arm program. So the current crop of systems is either 80 core single socket or 160 core dual NUMA dual socket. Um, like I said, that's the the original Thunder X systems were 96 cores. I th it was the uh, 96 compute units. I don't know exactly if it was cores or whether these were quad uh, split, um, but it was really slow. Um, and it was really slow, but there were lots of cores. So you could do a lot of useful work, a lot of work. Oh, yeah, so multi-core systems are hard. Um, I, and and I'd say, so, uh, I would say multi, uh, what was considered parallel computing at the start of my career was an eight-core system. And nowadays, that's so completely ordinary as to not even warrant mention. Um, now, uh, 64 cores or more is a lot. And I think there are systems with 512 cores, 1,000 cores, like just some stupidly large number that you would definitely want to have some help in. You're not going to be able to fill all those things from the command line, okay? Not working by yourself. So one, one thing that helps for that is containerization and uh, some sort of scheduler like Kubernetes that can put workloads on those sorts of things. That's good up to a certain point, but the Kubernetes authors never assume that there would be a 512 core machine. And so you get some constraints on how much you can schedule on one box. And I think that's being addressed. Um, you have, you run into the general problem of Amdahl's law, which dates from Gene Amdahl in the 60s, I think when he was building supercomputers and basically saying, if you have a bunch of parallel processes going at the same time, the thing that you're going to really be stopped by is not the parallelization. It's going to be some serial process that can't be parallelized that's going to be your slow point. So you could have 512, 511 cores working away in parallel, but one stupid configure script is uh, grinding away one one test at a time, and you won't finish until that thing slowly finishes. So just the, the physics of the world work against you when you and you have to come you have to compensate for that. Um, we we also ran into some parallel instructions, the SIMD instructions, where very early ARM systems didn't do those very well, so the very early ports didn't tend to have really robust support for that, that's gotten a lot better. And if a project is mature enough to work with the parallel code, have really good test suite, have a really good um, performance-minded environment, then if some of the code is parallelizable with the SIMD instructions, you can get 10x speed up on the whole task because th those instructions are very, are very powerful compared to, um, uh, to, to other things. Um, the other thing about uh, highly parallel machines is just familiarity. Like, not very many people have them on their desktop, right? It, and so not many people are developing with that in their mind as, like, what's possible. Um, uh, it's helped that people, lots of more people have ARM64 systems on their desktop, so a lot of stuff has been flushed out by the, the MacBook series. Um, but these are like only 8, 10, 12 core only, right, machines. They're, and so when people are doing algorithm development and testing and testing parallelization and testing how things will scale, I'm hoping at some point in the talk I'll be able to, uh, in the weekend I'll be able to bring up a shell on one of these machines and see how it was just a notice that LZ4 got parallelized, which is a compression algorithm. And they touted their 8x speed ups on an 8 core machine. And I want to test to see if we get 80x speed up on an 80 core machine, right? So, yeah, I mean, just like, let's give that a try, right? No, no reason not to. Or see where it falls apart. Running it on a giant system, yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I had that. There was a parallelization project. Uh, Gzip lends itself to parallelization. There's a program, PigZ, which is a parallel Gzip. You rearrange the letters. Um, and uh, I was able to get that very old um, Cavium Thunder X machine to be completely competitive with the modern x86 machines of its time on that one benchmark, right? That was the one benchmark because I could get, you know, I, because it was a, you know, it was a 96 core machine, right? You divide your gigabytes into 96 parts, so they're not very big. Um, I think at one point I was memory bandwidth bound rather than compute bound. So, all right, that's a lot of time I took. Thanks, everyone.